A wave of Aztec warriors slams against the Spartan phalanx. Bronze spears jut out from behind the wall of shields, slashing the flesh of the unarmored Aztec soldiers. From behind the front lines, wooden spears fly through the air, impaling themselves into several Spartan hoplites. An elite Aztec warrior climbs on top of the shoulders of the men fighting against the impenetrable Spartan wall. He launches himself over the Spartan shields and lands amongst their ranks. The Aztec slams his obsidian club into one of the nearby soldiers, knocking him out. He slashes the neck of another before several short swords penetrate his chest, but at that point the damage is done. The Spartan phalanx has been broken and with it, the war could be lost. Aztec and Spartan soldiers were two of the most deadly fighters of the past. They never met as the two civilizations were separated by time and distance. But if they had, who would win? In this scenario, we'll imagine what would happen if the Aztec and Spartan armies met one another on the battlefield at the height of their power. Only one civilization can claim victory. Let's find out who will come out on top. Both sides prepare for war. Their motivations for fighting and what victory means are very different. The Aztecs and Spartans each want more land, resources, and people to grow their empires. However, the Aztecs also need to capture sacrificial victims to offer to their gods. Every able-bodied Aztec man is expected to participate in the Song of Shields, where they go on conquest to battle and capture other warriors and bring them back for large festivals where the victims get sacrificed to the gods by priests and shamans. This tactic has worked for the Aztecs, as they are now in control of 200,000 square kilometers of territory. This land is broken up into 38 provinces. From within the empire, they extract tribute from 371 city-states, all of which help maintain the thriving Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan. The constant warring and battles to gather sacrificial victims have made the Aztec army practically unbeatable. The Spartans launched their military campaigns mostly to deal with existential threats, such as invasion forces from foreign lands. Epic battles like the one at the hot gates of Thermopylae have secured the position of Spartan warriors as some of the fiercest fighters in history. The Spartans control around 8,500 square kilometers, and when they dispatch soldiers to the surrounding area, it's not to collect sacrificial victims, but to suppress slave revolts and put city-states that have ideas of freedom in their place. Sparta also keeps an eye on their Greek neighbors in Athens and Thebes. Both of these cultures are constantly at odds with Sparta. But when Sparta goes to war, it is to gain power in land. They have no interest in taking enemy soldiers alive. The battlefield will be covered in their enemy's blood as the Spartan army marches toward a final epic battle against their new foe, the Aztecs. Aztec citizens have been preparing for the coming war since the day they were born. They are indoctrinated into a culture that rewards bravery and keen battle skills. From a young age, boys train in special military compounds where they are taught how to use different weapons and tactics for defeating an enemy while also taking them alive. After hours of training, they are told stories of the gods and the brave Aztec warriors who serve them. Their entire childhood is based around war and sacrifice. During campaigns to capture sacrificial victims, the Aztec children accompany the warriors as porters, there to carry extra weapons and spears while also witnessing the glories of war. The soldiers in training watch the battle from afar to gain more insight into how an Aztec warrior fights and to learn tactics that will help them become as deadly and cunning as the greatest heroes in the army. Eventually, they are ready to graduate from training and join the ranks as true Aztec warriors, but first they must prove themselves. The young soldiers are sent to battle, where they are required to take their first captive alive. They use their obsidian clubs called makwahuit to wound their victims before knocking them out and tying them up with cord. Then the young warriors bring their sacrifice back to the veterans, who congratulate them and welcome them into their ranks. The young warriors cut off their long hair, which has been growing since the age of 10, and they are now men. The Spartans also train their children to become warriors from a young age. At the age of 7, males are sent to an agoge, where they are taught how to fight and think like a Spartan warrior. These boys live in group barracks and are put through rigorous training each day, only to go to sleep tired and wake up exhausted to do it all over again. They trained for over 10 years before moving out of the Agoge and joining the ranks of the Spartan army. It's this rigorous training at such a young age that instills discipline in each Spartan warrior. They are able to follow orders without a second thought. Entire units can move as one as they march across the battlefield in their phalanx structure. The training to become a Spartan warrior is so difficult that the Spartans look forward to going to battle, because it's easier than training. The Greek historian Plutarch even writes, their bodily exercises too were less rigorous during their campaigns and were allowed a regimen less rigid. They were the only men in the world for whom war brought a respite in the training for war. The thought of Spartan soldiers puts the fear of gods into the Greek citizens, but will they have the same effect on the Aztecs? Aztec spies called Kimichtin return from an expedition to find out what lies beyond the empire's current boundaries. 
They disguise themselves as local merchants, but in reality they walk among the enemy forces not to trade goods but to gather intel. They bring back word to the king of an army made up of strangely dressed soldiers with shining armor and long spears. The Aztec king calls on the warriors from across the empire to gather and launch a campaign against the foreign threat that called themselves Spartans. 400 men from each city are sent toward the enemy. Each of these units is commanded by its own senior warriors and are part of a group consisting of around 8,000 men. 24 of these divisions link up at the edge of the Aztec Empire, creating a force of 200,000 warriors. The huge army begins making its way toward the Spartans. In the lead are the scouting units. They wear yellow face paint and carry conch shells to signal the main force that's behind them. Within the leading group of scouts are also priests who adorn themselves with images of Huitzilopochtli, the Aztec sun god and the god of war. These priests will ensure that the gods are on the Aztec sides and will be able to make any sacrifice needed to appease the gods once the battles start. The priests cover themselves in bright Quetzal feathers and wear jade emblems pierced through their skin. The main force of the Aztec army extends for 25 kilometers as they march toward the Spartans. The most elite units are toward the front of the procession. Most of these warriors come from major cities. The warriors of Tenochtitlan are in the very front. The king of the Aztecs has joined the army and he'll make most wartime decisions with the aid of his Chiocuatl, or second in command. Four other warlords loyal to the king also stay by his side to aid in strategic decisions. They give orders to the commanders of each unit, who then disseminate the directives to their men. The Spartans have been warned of the imminent Aztec attack. They sound the call to arms. Every soldier in the army gathers outside the city before marching toward the battlefield. However, before they begin their campaign, a sacrifice must be made. As the sun rises, the Spartan king communes with the gods. His soldiers look on as he slaughters a goat. The warm crimson blood spills onto the ground. The soldiers say their prayers and suit up for the coming war. Every day they march, the Spartans also exercise. The warriors know they must keep their bodies limber for the coming battle. And just because they're about to engage an enemy does not mean that they can forego their daily workouts. They will meet their enemy the following day and all hell will break loose. Each Spartan warrior carries his own weapons. They have a helot slave that holds the other belongings, such as 20 days worth of food and water. All that the soldiers have to keep them warm are their long red capes. This has been the routine for hundreds of years. Spartan warriors don't sleep in tents or in large camps on their way to battle. Their hardened bodies lay on the rocky ground so they can rest under the twinkling stars of the heavens. The Spartans are vastly outnumbered. Their entire army consists of around 20,000 men. Most are helots and perioikoi, who are little more than men forced to fight or mercenaries. However, the 5,000 or so Spartan warriors who are true citizens should be more than enough to hold the line and decimate the enemy force. They pushed back the Persians from their homelands, and the Aztec threat should be no different. The day has come for the battle between the Aztecs and the Spartans. It's a warm summer morning. The sun peaks over the nearby hills, bathing the battlefield in a fiery glow. The Aztec priests did not sleep the previous night. Instead, they sacrificed Spartan citizens that strayed too far from the protection of their army or fortified towns. Huitzilopochtli must be offered enormous amounts of blood and human life to ensure victory for the Aztecs. The Spartans are doing the very same thing for their gods. Zeus is offered goats and pigs are sacrificed to Ares, the god of war. The official firebearer who carries the Pyphorus all the way from the sacred altar back in Sparta to the battlefields lights an inferno. The sacred animals are cooked and consumed by the men. The Spartans bathe and braid the long hair of their comrades as they prepare for battle. This will ensure that if they fall during combat, they will be prepared to meet the gods in the afterlife. When the morning rituals are complete, a trumpet sounds. The Spartan warriors sing the Song of Castor in honor of the Spartan war hero and demigod. This will help ensure that they are looked after during the war while also gaining more favor with the divine entities that rule the battlefield. After the song ends, the men begin to line up in formation. Final orders are given by the Spartan king. Every soldier listens intently as they would follow their king through the gates of Hades if he commanded it. Now that the gods have received their offerings from both sides, the battle can begin. The Spartans move away from their camp and set up their phalanx structure across the battlefield. They have a small cavalry force of a few hundred men set up to their side, ready to flank the enemy or provide support. The Aztec army is massive and the field upon which they battle is much larger than the hot gates at Thermopylae. The Spartan lines are only 10 men deep, but as long as the shield wall isn't breached, they will be victorious. The sun glints off the bronze shields and shines directly toward the Aztec warriors, who are hollering and posturing before the battle begins. War drums boom from within the massive army. The conch shells trumpet and screams of Aztec warriors fill the air. The Spartans have their own instruments as well. Soldiers within the ranks of the phalanx play flutes so that the soldiers might march in time together. The walls of Spartans slowly advance toward the Aztec enemy. The Aztecs hold their ground. 
They're waiting for the Spartans to get into range. As the phalanx approaches, the Aztec warriors release a barrage of javelins hurled by their atlatls. They're equipped with sharp rock or obsidian tips. Most of the javelins break against the Spartan armor, but some find their way into the weak spot between the breastplate and the helmet where the neck is exposed. These lucky shots puncture the Spartans' necks, and blood pours out of their severed carotid arteries. Spartans continue to march, stepping over their wounded and making sure that their shields stay tightly locked in formation. They seem unfazed by the enemy's ranged weapons. Every soldier in the Spartan army has the fear beat out of them during their time in the Agoge. They were bred and raised for battle. Nothing will stand in their way as they prepare to decimate the enemy. The Aztec king and his advisors look upon the battlefield from an elevated platform. They scour the landscape for any advantage for their troops. This particular region is relatively flat and void of vegetation. It'll pit the Aztec army against the Spartan army in a way that only their weapons, skills, and tactics will make a difference. It's unclear who will be victorious. The war drums of the Aztecs stop. The sound of the Spartan flutes eerily wafts across the battlefield. The Spartans are still advancing while the Aztecs await a signal to charge. The drums start beating again. Their rhythm increases in intensity and speed. The shouts from the Aztec ranks resume as they're ordered forward to conquer the enemy and bring sacrificial victims back to the capital. The Aztec soldiers sprint toward the Spartan front line. They're covered in war. Their animal pelts flail out behind them. The Spartans continue at the same pace. The soldiers tense their muscles, getting ready for the impact of enemy soldiers against their shields. The Aztecs close the gap. They're 100 feet away, 50 feet, 10 feet. Then it happens. The Aztec warriors slam into the Spartan phalanx. For a moment, the Spartans are pushed back from impact their feet digging into the dirt as they slide backward several feet. The initial momentum from the impact slows to a stop. The Aztec warriors bash the shields of the Spartans with their obsidian clubs and axes, but the bronze is too strong and their weapons either graze off them or shatter. The Aztecs continue their onslaught, looking for a weak spot in the Spartan wall. They find none. The commanders of the Spartan army give the order to push. Every Spartan soldier in every row of the phalanx pushes forward at the same time. The Aztecs are forced several feet back. Milliseconds after the push, the soldiers in the second line of the phalanx thrust their spears through the small gaps in the shield wall. Their sharpened blades cut through Aztec flesh. Thousands of Aztec warriors are impaled by the bronze spear tips and die instantly. Their round chimale shields and finely woven cotton body armor, which has been soaked in salt water to make it more resistant, provide little protection against the Spartan weapons. The Spartan phalanx continues forward as they march over the fallen bodies of enemy soldiers. Men in the back of the phalanx make sure anyone still alive receives a spear through the heart before they rejoin the ranks of their peers. The Aztecs continue to try to break the line, but to no avail. The Spartan commanders spot a group of Aztec warriors breaking off from the main army to try to circle behind the phalanx. This cannot be allowed to happen. If the enemy gets behind them, all will be lost. A trumpet sounds. The Spartan cavalry rides around the main force to meet the flanking Aztec soldiers head on. They tear through the Aztec ranks using their spears and short swords to decimate some of the most elite soldiers in the enemy army. The Aztecs are no match for the heavily armored Spartan soldiers that sit high atop their war horses. Several of the cavalry units are pulled from their steeds and slaughtered by obsidian blades, but most of the Aztec soldiers are forced to retreat back to the main body of their army for protection. Suddenly, a conch shell blows in rapid succession. The fighting stops as the Aztec army turns and runs in what appears to be a retreat. The front line is forced to keep fighting while the men in the back run away. Every now and then, a cunning Aztec warrior slips a knife through the shield wall and injures or kills a Spartan soldier. However, he is quickly replaced, so the phalanx never breaks. The Aztecs try to deflect the spears lashing out at them, but with very little success. The battlefield begins to clear. The Spartans do not let up. They continue their march forward. The Aztec force halts a few hundred feet away. Although the Spartans have killed thousands and thousands of Aztecs, they are still vastly outnumbered. The Aztecs have claimed the lives of a few hundred Spartans, and it seems that they're ready to battle once again. The Spartans continue toward the front line of the Aztec army. As they cross the battlefield, they notice the ground becomes soft and almost spongy under their feet. The Spartans pay little attention to this change in the texture of the ground and continue onward. This is new land for them, and the terrain is unfamiliar. When the Spartans approach the Aztec army, they notice the soldiers are smiling. It's as if they know something the Spartans do not. Suddenly, a series of blasts sound from the conch shells. The ground behind the Spartans begins to shift and explodes upward. The Aztecs had dug large holes under the cover of the previous night and hidden hundreds of soldiers in them. Before the sun rose, they concealed the holes with a false ground, so the warriors would be hidden until the opportune moment. That moment had arrived, and the hidden soldiers revealed themselves. Unfortunately for the Spartans, this Aztec force is now behind the phalanx. The main Aztec army darts forward and crashes into the shield wall once again. Simultaneously, the hidden Aztec warriors attack the soldiers in the back. 
The Aztecs have a plan. Once the hidden forces fiercely strike one section in the back of the Spartan army, the surprise attack catches them off guard, and many Spartan soldiers are brought down by obsidian clubs to the head. The Aztec soldiers force their way through the middle of the Spartan ranks, which are now being attacked from both the front and the back. These Aztecs have only one mission – break the shield wall. As the Aztec warriors make their way through the Spartans, they don't necessarily kill them, but they drive them aside so they can reach the front line. The final push by the hidden Aztec force breaks through the shield wall from the back. The Spartan warriors stagger forward as the Aztec soldiers shatter their defenses from behind. The Spartan phalanx has been broken and the army is now separated into two parts. The Aztecs rush through a gap to encircle the Spartans. This is a worst-case scenario for the Spartans. Now they are surrounded, their phalanx no longer matters. The much larger Aztec army might not have weapons or armor that the Spartans have, but eventually they will overcome them through sheer numbers. But for each Spartan that falls to obsidian blades and well-placed atlatl darts, the Aztecs gain access to their enemy's deadly arsenal. The Aztec soldiers grab the bronze shields off the ground and short swords from the belts of Spartans. They use them to hack at the enemy as more and more Aztec warriors flood onto the battlefield and surround the Spartans. With access to the Spartan spears, the Aztecs are able to dismount the small cavalry force. As the battle rages on, there is a holler from one of the most respected warriors in the Aztec army. The soldiers surrounding him back off and form a circle. In the middle of the circle is a veteran Spartan soldier and the most deadly Aztec warrior in the entire army. They circle one another, sizing up their foe. The battling continues all around, but these two warriors are only focused on one another. The Aztec war hero rushes forward and jumps high into the air with his makwapit raised over his head. The Spartan brings up his shield and deflects the blow from the Aztec warrior. He parries and thrusts his spear forward. It slices through the side of his enemy. The Aztec warrior backs off and touches the wound. He looks at the blood dripping from his fingers and smiles. He gives his adversary a slight bow as a sign of respect. But the Spartan is exhausted. Even though he has trained all his life for battle, the unrelenting waves of Aztec soldiers have sapped much of his energy. The Aztec warrior pulls out an obsidian knife, so he now holds a deadly weapon in each hand. He sprints toward the Spartan and waits for the right moment. The Spartan soldier thrusts his spear forward in hopes of impaling the Aztec through the stomach, but at the last moment he falls to his knees and slides under the spear tip. Using his momentum, the Aztec warrior slashes the Achilles tendon of the Spartan with his knife. The Spartan falls to one knee as the Aztec warrior stands back up. The Spartan soldier tosses his spear aside and draws his short sword, knowing that he'll have to fight for his life in close combat. The Aztec brings his makwahuit down just as the Spartan brings up his sword. They crash together. In that moment, the Spartan thrusts the side of his shield into the stomach of the Aztec, knocking him backward. However, as the Spartan tries to stand, the searing pain from his cut Achilles tendon causes him to fall back to the ground. The Aztec warrior recovers and kicks the Spartan in the chest, sending him falling backward. The Aztec warrior jumps on top of the Spartan. He slams the blunt end of the Makwahuit into the Spartan's helmet, knocking him out. He will make an excellent sacrifice to the gods. All around the battlefield, Spartans begin to fall. In one-on-one -on -one combat, they defeat the Aztec warriors, but they're now outnumbered almost 100 to 1. There are just too many Aztecs, and in the end, sheer numbers cause the Spartan army to fall. All things being equal, if 1,000 Spartans were to go against 1,000 Aztecs, the Spartans would win every time. They have superior weapons and armor made of bronze. The obsidian blades of the Aztecs are deadly but would be almost completely ineffective against a heavily armored Spartan hoplite. That being said, if the Spartans could hold out long enough and extend the war over the course of several months, the Aztecs would likely succumb to disease in the same way they had when the Spanish conquistadors swept across Mexico. It's estimated that smallpox killed around 5 to 8 million Aztecs during the Spanish conquest. However, new studies suggest that another disease, called enteric fever, might have killed as many as 15 million people in Mexico when the Spanish arrived. These were diseases that were brought to the Americas by the Europeans. And since smallpox has been recorded as existing during the time of ancient Egypt, it's likely the Spartans would have had immunity to the disease while it ravaged the Aztec population. So the longer the Spartans could last, the more likely they would have been to defeat the Aztecs. Again, it's important to note that if the two armies had met at their height, the Spartans would have been so greatly outnumbered, they would have had eventually succumbed to the Aztec army from just pure exhaustion. However, if the two forces contained the same number of soldiers, there's little doubt the Spartans would have been victorious and slaughtered the entire Aztec force, while only sustaining minimal casualties due to their superior weapons and armor. Both societies placed heavy emphasis on war and trained their children from a young age to be warriors, so it's hard to tell who would win in hand-to-hand -hand combat if an Aztec fought a Spartan without weapons. Archaeological records indicate that Spartan warriors tended to be around 6 feet tall and weigh close to 200 pounds. On the other hand, Aztec warriors were closer to 5.5 feet and weighed around 150 pounds. 
As such, the Spartans would have had the upper hand in this situation as well. Either way, if the entirety of these two armies were set against each other on a level battlefield with no choke points, an Aztec victory was likely an inevitable outcome. However, if the Spartans were able to use the landscape to negate the Aztec numbers advantage like they did at the hot gates of Thermopylae against the Persians, they would have been victorious. Now watch actual reason why Spartan Empire went extinct, or check out why the Aztec Empire fell.